what specifically has changed so that we're now making more progress than we did before? Well, the amazing thing is it's not just one advance, it's a confluence of technological advances that have occurred. For example, our ability to sequence the genome in hours for a few thousand dollars, what took several billion dollars and an entire decade just 10 years ago. So that enables us to look at the genetic makeup of a tumor and apply the right drug for that patient. The ability to model the disease in mice, genetically engineered mice, so that we can recapitulate the disease and test new drugs or to develop new diagnostics is game changing. The ability to have nanotechnology deliver drugs in the right place at the right time, so on and so forth. So it's broad-based enablement that has enabled us to understand this disease on a very elemental level and act upon it. The approach to cancer, that decisive assault, that Normandy invasion, is really about approaching the disease across the continuum of care. It's about preventing the disease. 50% of cancers can be prevented. It's also about detecting the disease early, where the chances for cure are greatest sim by simple excision of the disease. Cutting it out. That's right. And the differences in survival between, let's say, stage one localized cancer versus advanced disease is quite significant. In the case of treatment, we have a much better understanding of the instigators of cancer, the underlying genes, those rogue genes that are driving those particular cancers that are critical dependencies for that cancer. And using targeted agents against those specific abnormalities is enabling us to have much greater control over the disease. But in that treatment space, a game-changing series of events has just occurred, and that is that we have a whole new class of drugs now that can harness the power of the immune system. The immune system is arrested in cancer. Cancers have figured out how to suppress the immune system so that it's not recognized as foreign. So the, the body individual. can't protect you against cancer That's because right. the immune system switched the, off. The immune system is suppressed by the cancer. And an investigator here, Jim Allison, discovered that suppression mechanism, developed the drug to deactivate that suppression mechanism, and individuals with advanced melanoma, these are individuals that would succumb from the disease within six to 12 months, uniformly lethal, 23% of those patients are cured of the disease. That's the first class in this new class of drugs. We also have a second drug that when added to that first drug now increases the level of durable responses. We can't say cure yet because the drug hasn't been around long enough to over 50 percent. So just in that one class of drugs for this one cancer which is uniformly lethal in an advanced state you've gone from a hundred percent mortality to now what appears to be over 50% cure rate for the disease. So that enables us to build on that knowledge so that we can apply it to other cancers and find other ways to harness the power of the immune system. So it's that immune type of drug coupled with the other targeted therapies that are squarely directed at the underlying rogue genes that are operative in that particular cancer is what's giving us optimism that we're going to turn the corner on advanced disease. But our job is far from done. I hope in my lifetime, I certainly hope I'm going to live long enough to see one day that we have better screening and diagnostic tests for picking up on cancer. I suspect sometime we're going to look back at all these x-rays that can only pick up something when it's well visible and possibly further advanced than you'd want. I think one day, do you think we look back and think this was the dark ages in terms of screening and diagnostics? Well, there's no question that the greatest opportunity that we have is to prevent the disease in the first place. 
and this is an area that is central to the mission of MD Anderson. When you think about prevention, it's important to recognize that 50% of cancers could be prevented. And so we have to understand, well, what is driving the development of cancer in the first place? That we could use that knowledge to prevent a disease. So first and foremost, tobacco. Tobacco is responsible for an enormous fraction of cancer cases, as well as other diseases. Uh, and it's, it's alarming to know that most individuals who start smoking start smoking as children. So we have a responsibility as adults to ensure and protect child health. And we're, we're not doing that. We need to be far more aggressive in ensuring that our children are uh, dissuaded from pursuing that path. In addition, uh, we have early childhood sun exposure uh, that uh, leads to melanoma. Decades later, there's a period of vulnerability. So we can, if we had education uh, in grade school, as we did for traffic safety and seatbelts, and we informed children that they had to be protected from the sun, we would have a dramatic impact on the incidence of melanoma decades later. And then we have enormous problems with respect to obesity, which is a major driver of cancer as well. Those are all things that require a commitment to education of our children. They require legislation, for example, to prevent children from going to tanning salons, which are major carcinogenic vehicles that drive very high rates of skin cancer here in the United States and around the world. So prevention is about implementing knowledge that we have today and being as aggressive as possible to prevent that kind of behavior that leads to cancer decades later. The other area that is critical for us to seize the opportunities is an early detection of cancer. There was just a major news item uh, from MD Anderson. We had discovered this molecule in the blood. Uh, this is the work of Bob Bast. Dr. Bast discovered CA-125 which is a biomarker in the blood that allows one to signal the presence of ovarian cancer. And results uh, have just been developed that indicate that this is a very promising screening vehicle to identify women with ovarian cancer well before the disease becomes a significant problem. So we need to build on those kinds of successes. And here again, technology is transforming our ability to analyze the blood of individuals who might have a disease. We have PSA, for example, for prostate cancer. We now have CA-125 for ovarian cancer. But what we need is a systematic effort to identify those biomarkers so that you or I could go to our annual physical, get a blood test, and have every biomarker for the major cancers be analyzed in one fell swoop so that you would know that you have a cancer that is an occult disease within your body and then we would go and identify it and do something about it. So those opportunities to impact on mortality through early detection are tremendous. It's not just the detection but it's also the ability to look at that cancer at the molecular level and determine whether or not that particular cancer is hardwired for lethality and needs to be treated aggressively or is a relatively indolent disease. So early detection must be coupled with adequate risk modeling so you can enlist the right patient population into screening Secondly, to have the right kind of molecular prognostication so that you can say that a cancer is a bad actor or not, and then aggressively treat those cancers and not the ones that are indolent that could, upon treatment, lead to many more problems than you're solving. So it's not just about going to the doctor and getting a checkup and the doctor being able to do a nice early, perhaps a blood test that says, oh, you've got cancer. It's also about the doctor being able to say, 
oh you've got cancer actually probably this one we'll just watch it's probably not going to do much but this one we definitely will need to act on and here's your course of treatment is that the way it will evolve that is the way it will evolve it's about uh, understanding those at risk aggressively screening those individuals and then having discovered a cancer identifying which cancers needed to be acted upon and then if they does need to be acted upon then the next level is to have personalized cancer therapy based on the underlying genetic aberrations that are resident in that person's cancer. So you need the complete package from risk all the way through to precision medicine, precision application of drugs for that person's underlying genetics. Well, our work is not done. Uh, it's going to be some time before we can really declare victory, but there's no question that we're at a true turning point. Even with the limited knowledge that we had of the disease over the last two decades, we've had a very significant decline in cancer mortality due to prevention, screening, and targeted therapies and better knowledge. Because there have been false stones before. There have been so many times when doctors got all excited about you know, previous forms of immunotherapy or all excited about hormone therapy or whatever, and then five, ten years later not quite getting the results they'd hoped? Well, the reality is that uh, we have, for the first time, are able to connect knowledge to new therapeutic interventions that are having durable responses in patients. And so the results with IPI that you mentioned earlier with melanoma, the PD-1, uh, results, another game changer. I think everyone feels that we're at a true inflection point in the history of the field where we now have a significant amount of knowledge of what causes cancer. We have the technology to be able to begin to detect cancer earlier and we have a much better understanding of the genetics of the disease and are applying that knowledge to have more precise medicines be applied in combination to patients. So that did not exist until relatively recently. The confluence of all of those capabilities, the knowledge, the technology, and the proof of concept in the clinic is changing the way that we view this disease. Are we there? Far from it. A third of patients do not survive their encounter with cancer. We have a lot of work to do, particularly in in brain cancer, in pancreas cancer, in advanced colon cancer. We've yet to crack that armor. We need more science, more understanding to illuminate a path that would impact on those diseases. But for many diseases, we are seeing increasingly significant progress that will change the statistics for those individuals with, with those particular diseases.